Now the time has come for us to show you the profile of today's event moderator, Mr. Ihwan Sukardi, SHLLM, MMPKP. Berikutnya kami sajikan profil dari moderator kita yang akan membantu jalannya diskusi, Bapak Iwan Sukati, SHLLM, MMBKP. Bapak Iwan adalah partner teks pada RSM Indonesia dan juga memegang posisi sebagai Deputy Managing Partner serta Head of Energy Sector pada RSM Indonesia. Sebelum bergabung dengan RSM Indonesia, Bapak Iwan menjadi partner teks selama hampir 20 tahun pada KPMG Indonesia dan juga pernah sebagai Head of Corporate Tax pada PT Medco Energi Internasional TBK selama lebih dari 3 tahun. Pada saat ini Bapak Iwan memegang posisi sebagai Chairman of International Fiscal Association atau IFA untuk Indonesia. Bapak Iwan juga menjabat sebagai Ketua Departemen Hubungan Alma Mater Ilundi Fiaui. Selain itu, aktif juga di beberapa organisasi lain seperti Indonesian Petroleum Association, Ikatan Konsultan Pajak Indonesia. Bapak Iwan juga sangat aktif menjadi pembicara baik di Indonesia maupun di luar negeri mengenai perpajakan, transfer pricing, investasi, dan topik perpajakan lainnya. Bapak Iwan juga aktif menulis pada beberapa surat kabar, majalah, dan penerbitan baik lokal maupun internasional. Bapak Iwan juga menjadi pengajar di beberapa universitas ternama baik di dalam negeri maupun di luar negeri seperti Leiden University di Belanda, Chinese Cultural University di Taiwan, dan Universitas Indonesia Fakultas Ilmu Administrasi. Baik, tanpa berlama lagi, Bapak Iwan kami persilakan. without further ado. Uh, this uh, afternoon we have three, I mean we are uh, lucky we have three professors here, uh, experts on international tax. Uh, uh, let me introduce the first speaker, pa, uh, Professor Gunadi. Professor Gunadi is uh, the uh, professor of uh, tax uh, in the Faculty of uh, Administrative Science. Uh, Prof. Gunadi uh, obtained uh, his uh, bachelor degree in accounting from uh, Gajan Mada University and uh, obtained his master degree in, in from Institute of Public Finance in The Hague. So you must be familiar, uh, Jan. <laughs> and also, uh, he received his uh, PhD from uh, Leiden University. Uh, and was uh, awarded as, as professor uh, in 2008 in this faculty. So, uh, uh, Professor Gunadi uh, hold uh, several uh, prestigious positions within the Director of General Taxes, and he writes uh, also uh, a lot of books, uh, and they are all uh, reference for all the Indonesian tax students. Uh, the first session here, Prof. Gunadi will uh, cover uh, PEPS uh, action and its implementation in Indonesia. So, uh, Prof. Uh, Gunadi, uh, now I'll give the uh, time to you, uh, 30 to 45 minutes. Thank you.
Profesor Universitas Indonesia Profesor Safi Nurmandu Dan yang tangannya kan calon profesor semuanya Selamat siang ya Ini Terima kasih Ya tidak usah diterjemahkan jadi saya langsung pakai bahasa kita aja Mungkin campur-campur aja Uh, first, uh, I would like to introduce uh, what is BEP. Uh, BEP itu singkatan dari BIS, Erosion, Profit Shifting. Jadi maksudnya erosi basis, basis pajak berupa shifting profits. Shifting profits itu penggeseran laba from one country to another country, especially to the low or no tax country. According to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, this erosion and profit shifting or perhaps refer to the tax avoidance strategies that exploit gaps and mismatches in tax rules to artificially shift profits to low or no tax jurisdiction. Jadi kuncinya adalah di sini adanya suatu gaps, gaps itu suatu disparitas atau perbedaan. Perbedaan kalau pajak itu macam-macam perbedaan, terutama gaps in tax rate. Jadi berbagai macam tarif ya. Di sana kita tarif korporat dengan tax kita 25%. But the rate in Singapore is 70%. Dari tim Brasil, tim Kanada 15%, in Jerman also 15%, Korea 22%, US 21%. Nah ini beda-beda tarif ini menyebabkan adanya keinginan atau tendensi to save profits from the high tax country dari Indonesia, misalnya Indonesia 5%, dia geser ke Malaysia maka dia dapat tax saving lima persen, delapan persen dari dua lima persen beda dengan tujuh belas persen. Kemudian yang kedua selain adanya gaps adalah adanya mismatch. Mismatch itu menunjukkan suatu apa suatu perbedaan pelapan pajak antara satu negara dengan negara lain. For example Indonesia tax the partnership yeah, uh, under the what you call the non-transparency system yang dikenakan pajaknya adalah badannya but in Netherlands uh, the taxpayer is just the owner jadi yang kena pajak bukan partnershipnya tapi adalah partner karena ada suatu mismatch maka ini biasanya uh, Residen from one country, ya. sebagai contoh, uh, residen dari Indonesia untuk menghindari dikenakan pajak, uh, dia memberikan uh, partnership misalnya di Netherlands. Oleh karena di Netherlands yang dikenakan adalah uh, ownernya, padahal ownernya berada di Indonesia, berarti tidak dikenakan pajak oleh Netherlands. Itu sebagai contoh mismatching. Ya. Dan kemudian, yang kedua, mismatching di dalam uh, objek uh, di Indonesia untuk ke uh, profit sharing debt, profit sharing debt, uh, the interest is taxable as interest, but the profit yeah, di Indonesia by this uh, uh, debt owner is tax as a dividend so there is a mismatch uh, kemudian cara terangnya in the tax rules to artificially shift jadi secara artificial jadi secara uh, rekayasa secara rekayasa digeser umumnya rekayasa ini melalui suatu uh, sarana sebagai SPV atau special purpose vehicle ya. 
sebagai sebuah purpose legal atau kode company ya, atau sebuah purpose entity uh, sudah sekalian uh, penyebab uh, kenapa web ini terjadi ya? web ini terjadi yang pertama adalah uh, biasanya dengan profit setting tadi menghasilkan suatu tax setting jadi penyimpanan pajak ya nah, kemudian regulasi pajak global itu umumnya masih sifatnya konvensional jadi eh, tax base nya atau the, the tax uh, legend nya atau tax attached nya itu masih dilihat kepada objek sama uh, subjek apalagi kalau di sistem kita Indonesia itu jadi mengkategoriskan konten kata sebagai subjektif teks karena itu dicari dulu subjektifnya baru kemudian dikenakan pajaknya nah subjeknya ini tentu akan kesulitan ya. terutama sekali misalnya kita lihat dengan Google Asia Pacific Google Asia Pacific dia itu sebagai resident company di Singapura tapi dia duit bisnis di Indonesia tanpa adanya suatu fixed base of business di sini. Oleh karena itu, there is no uh, taxable assistance in Indonesia. And it is very difficult to uh, impose a tax here. Ini sebagai contoh ya. Tetapi ya, mohon maaf, Indonesia ini kan banyak akal gitu. Jadi ada kekurangan akal. Walaupun dia nggak ada subjeknya, tapi toh juga bisa dikenakan pajak. Jadi ada tiga pendekatan pemajakan terhadap uh, 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 pemberian servis atau jasa oleh Google ya. Misalnya kalau kita lihat di Inggris, Inggris itu mempergunakan apa yang dikenal sebagai uh, uh, diverted profit tax. Jadi profit yang dibawa pergi, dibawa lari ya dari sos negeri, walaupun subjeknya berada di luar itu dikenakan pajak oleh Inggris. Kalau kita ikut Inggris, itu akan sulit. Ya. Yang kedua adalah uh, model-model India. India itu menggunakan equalization tax. Jadi yang dikenakan pajak adalah pengguna jasa. Jadi service consumer in his country. Jadi kalau misalnya ke Indonesia, yang dikenakan pajak adalah para pengguna jasa Google yang ada di Indonesia. Akhirnya apa? Akhirnya mengenakan pajak pada residen taxpayer. Ya. Ini karena kita mengenal apa eh, sebagai negara hukum. Jadi tadi karena pajak subjektif itu yang digunakan adalah subjeknya. Jadi bukan digeser. Kalau digeser itu pajak tidak langsung. Jadi kalau Indonesia menggeser kepada eh, service consumer itu sama juga menggeser pajak langsung. Jadi pajak tidak langsung itu kalau di saya akademis kan salah itu makanya Indonesia tidak lakukan ini yang dilakukan Indonesia adalah mengadakan semacam mutual agreement yaitu mutual agreement dengan eh, Google Asia Pacific walaupun mungkin tidak tidak optimal tapi bagi Indonesia something is better than nothing dan kemudian selanjutnya adalah eh, bahwa Tax regulation now, ya, about the international aspect, itu very easy ya, to be avoided by multinational corporation. Oleh karena itu, kita lagi berusaha untuk mereform, reformasi undang-undang pajak pengasal kita. Namun karena tahun 2019 adalah tahun politik, ya, oleh karena itu tidak dilakukan revisi pajak itu. Karena punya tidak populer reformasi pajak. Makanya yang sekarang diberikan adalah justru fasilitas-fasilitas perpajakan. Nah, kemudian selanjutnya ya, penyebabnya adalah eh, profit shifting. Ya. Jadi mendapat penghematan pajak itu sekaligus memberikan keunggulan kompetitif bagi perusahaan yang bersangkutan. Jadi dia mempunyai suatu eh, eh, competitive eh, advantage bagi perusahaan yang bersangkutan dan kemudian yang selanjutnya adalah umumnya cara-cara itu adalah eh, yang dihindari adalah pajak di negara sumber 
Jadi sebenarnya dia dapat uh, income di this company, di revenue income from Indonesia, but uh, he is not the like to pay tax in Indonesia. Jadi pasca negara sumber. Ya. Sedangkan yang keenam adalah umumnya tadinya model India, model UK, model Indonesia itu kan solusi pasca masing-masing kan. Ini sampai saat ini belum dikenal solusi yang bisa eh, masalah terhadap sistem-sistem yang demikian. Eh, Kebetulan eh, risiko dari debt ya itu paling kurang ada tiga hal ya. Yang pertama adalah risiko penerimaan. Jadi penerimaan akan defisit, defisit terus ya. Karena tax base nya digeser ya. Nah, kemudian yang kedua, yang terjadi adalah uh, selama ada uh, profit shifting to the no or no tax country Oleh karena itu, kalau untuk menghindari bed, ya silahkan tarif pajaknya diturunkan Ini yang biasanya kalau tarif pajaknya diturunkan, barangkali menjadi berkurang Sedangkan yang ketiga yang muncul di Indonesia sekarang Akibat daripada bed itu adalah uh, banyaknya sekitar pajak, tax deduction Baik di dalam pemeriksaan pajak, ada sekitar, umumnya ketika apa wajib pajak diperiksa, kemudian diberikan SPAP, umumnya mereka tidak setuju, tidak seberapa dengan SPAP. Ketika closing conference, mereka juga tidak setuju, kemudian ketika diterbitkan SKPKB, dia mengajukan keberatan. Hilals and objection. Ya. Objection umumnya kalau sudah sekarang ditolak. Ya, ditolak. Karena apa? Karena ada suatu paham, jadi kalau merubah tax assessment atau tax bill itu sama juga dengan merugikan negara. So he make loss to the country, yeah, that's why it become involving the corruption, that is problem. Yeah. Oleh karena itu keberatan cenderung itulah dan yang sekarang terjadi di pengadilan pajak dalam kali ini Pak Itu sama juga bahwa apa? Alasannya tidak pernah dibicarakan materinya. Jadi hakim pengadilan pajak hanya menyatakan bahwa penolakan keberatan itu sudah sesuai dengan peraturan perundang yang berlaku, yaitu pasal 26 Undang-Undang KP. Oleh karena itu penolakan keberatan dipertahankan. Nah, ini lah. Tapi yang tidak apa-apa dengan PBB ini berarti rezekinya teman-teman konsultan pajak ini yang banyak. Kemudian untuk uh, mengadres ya, atau menangkal BEPS ya, menangkal BEPS ya, ini OECD dan G20 ya, along with different countries termasuk Indonesia participated in the development of the BEPS package targeted at establishing a modern international tax framework and the wage profits and tax where economic activity and fair inflation occur. Jadi kunci utama dari BEPS itu menagi, ya, ya profitnya itu di shifting shifting terserah di mana, tapi bahwa nanti tax base nya itu di connected dengan ekonomi kreativitas dan value creation nya. Tapi ternyata juga untuk menentukan to indicate where the economic activity uh, is located atau the uh, value creation is order, itu juga tidak mudah karena nanti tergantung kepada rumusan peraturan masing-masing negara nanti masing-masing negara tentu akan merumuskan tentang sumber penghasilan jadi uh, source of income rules sebagai contoh uh, misalnya yang tidak mudahnya itu misalnya kalau kita ingin mendefinisikan sumber penghasilan bunga ya kalau Indonesia itu kan dua kriterinya yang pertama adalah uh, Bunga itu di dari siapa, jadi paying approach, pembayarnya siapa. Yang kedua adalah cost approach, jadi menjadi beban siapa. Tapi mungkin negara lain barangkali mungkin mendesikkan pada usage approach. Jadi loan-nya itu dipakai di mana. Yang keempat mungkin dia mendesikkan merujuk kepada pemberi. Jadi pemberi si kreditornya itu di mana. Mungkin yang kelima dia merujuk pada kontraknya. Kontrak kredit itu ditekan di mana? Sebab kontrak kredit juga penting juga. 
Oleh karena itu, menentukan file creation juga tidak mudah. Dan masing-masing negara punya kepentingan masing-masing. Nah, kemudian eh, maps package ini sudah sama-sama kita ketahui bahwa daerah 15 maps actions ada tujuh dihasilkan pada tahun 2014 sedangkan yang 8 itu di finish pada tahun 2015 Jadi yang pertama ini tentang digital economics. Tadi digital economics sudah kami sampaikan. Jadi pendekatan Indonesia tapi itu adalah praktek. Sedangkan regulasinya belum dibuat. Jadi ini hebat Indonesia. Indonesia ya luar biasa gitu. Jadi this country my post tax bill tadi regulasi. Just the agreement. That is our uh, beauty of Indonesia. Yang kedua, hybrid action. Hybrid action ini ya kita belum ada sesuatu. Kita mau kemana arahnya? Apakah kita mau eh, non transparent? Ya. Berarti yang kita gunakan pajak adalah eh, pajaknya atau kita transparent? Jadi yang kita kena pajak adalah eh, pajaknya. Sedangkan yang ketiga adalah eh, action ketiga adalah CFC rules. CFC rules ini pada tahun 2017 sudah dikeluarkan aturannya. Nah, cuma gini, ya, aturannya di dalam PMK itu ternyata the scope-nya is a broader or wider than the scope uh, 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 than the scope the state in the law. Jadi karena di dalam undangnya itu hanya direct uh, ownership, tetapi di dalam regulation-nya itu ditingkatkan jadi direct ownership. Kemudian, reduction yang keempat itu introduction. Sudah ada peraturannya, kita di dua lama, kita ada debt to equity ratio, khususnya untuk general debt to equity ratio itu 4 banding 1. Kemudian yang kelima, full tax practices. Nah, ini, ini kita, hamful-hamful ini, kita tidak sadar, kita harus justru involved in the providing of full tax the, Kebetulan, karena apa? We provide for tax holiday, we provide for tax allowance, we provide for another tax incentives. Ya cuma alhamdulillah kita bukan yang kita harus ini. Jadi this not about to this harmful tax competition. <laughs> Tapi juga kita sediakan apa? Tax holiday juga ternyata tidak laris ini. Tidak, tidak, tidak mudah, tidak banyak peminat-peminat yang ini kurang tahu. Kenapa kok gunanya perang banyak? Karena apa ini suatu ciri khas Indonesia. Itu fasilitas itu selalu dibuat interlocking. Interlocking with the tax obligation. Jadi kalau masih ada tunggak-tunggak pajak, itu tidak diberikan. Walaupun tunggak pajaknya itu tunggak pajak si owner pemilik daripada suatu perusahaan. Padahal misalnya perusahaan baru gitu. Masa juga pun has a, apa, has a tax. Uh, debt itu kan tidak tidak mungkin tapi inilah uh, the beauty of Indonesia always make interlocking the something kemudian reflection yang keenam adalah uh, prevent treaty abuse jadi kita sudah ada treaty abuse dalam menyangkut uh, Indonesia membership ya tempat ini terkenal dengan DGT1 sama DGT2 tapi sekarang di apa di uh, singkat simplify dengan DGT saja jadi kalau ingin mendapatkan reduction of the DT, uh, the taxpayer must show the uh, certificate of domicile. Yeah. Kemudian action ketujuh adalah uh, non-existent of PE. Jadi yeah, non-existent of PE itu dalam prakteknya kita mengadakan mutual agreement. Walaupun ini not that put in writing, still in uh, oral. Kemudian transfer pricing action ini juga yang paling terakhir transfer pricing action ya. ini action delapan sampai sepuluh ya.
dan Action 13 tentang transfer pricing dokumentasi. Jadi yang apa ini transfer pricing dokumentasi itu banyak memberi berkat pada teman-teman konsultan. Kalau nggak salah satu dokumen yang TT Docs itu ya berapa Madrid Madrid kali ya Indonesia. Kalau Madrid Docs. Uh, kemudian Brief Action 12 itu tentang Disclosure Analysis Text Agresif Text Planning Ini memang pernah dijajaki tapi ya nyatanya teman-teman IKPI dan Asosiasi Konstant Pajak itu masih keberanian Karena dia menyatakan bahwa di Indonesia tidak ada Text Planning Dan kita juga ada MAP, Mutual Agreement Procedure Tapi dalam praktek juga not so many ya. Dan kemudian Brief Action 15 Ini untuk ke Multilateral Instrument Indonesia pada uh, 7 Juni 2017 itu sudah melaksanakan Multilateral Instrument ya. Sebenarnya implementasinya pada kali yang uh, masih kita tunggu ya. Jadi ini kalau di susun dari Bebsdokson dari 1 sampai 15 Itu Jidal Ekonomik Nantuan, Kultuanus Nomor 15 Kemudian Kultuanus itu Action 2, 4, 3, and 5 Sedangkan Substance itu uh, Action 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 Sedangkan Transparency itu adalah Action 11, 12, 13, and 14 Indonesia pada Bad Action ini dapat kami sampaikan bahwa Indonesia telah mendukung Bad eh, Action yaitu G20 ya. eh, kemudian eh, Indonesia juga mengikuti satu operasi tentang kegiatan Bad Action eh, kemudian Indonesia juga semaksimal mungkin mencoba melaksanakannya dan masuk kepada tindakan-tindakan global dengan bad action ini jadi tadi ada beberapa yang sudah dilakukan oleh Indonesia untuk melaksanakan bad action ini ya. tapi ada sebagian yang belum kita laksanakan yang pada saat sekarang ini terutama yang di lapangan itu yang jadi trading topik kita adalah transfer pricing cuma masalahnya transfer pricing itu menjadikan apa banyak tadi banyak sekitar pajak dan juga kita sifatnya masih bilateral jadi belum bilateral jadi maksudnya bahwa apa yang dihembuskan di dalam P3B artikel lain ya artikel 25 tentang map itu belum dilaksanakan terutama juga terus di proses oke jadi karena ketepatan waktu nanti kita banyak menerapkan dunia dari profesor Bina Nasyut sama profesor Yantuhu untuk 
Indonesia adalah salah satu negara G20 yang juga aktif di uh, 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 proses penyusunan BEPS Action kemudian juga review terhadap 15 uh, BEPS Action uh, dan uh, ada beberapa catatan penting uh, implementasinya di Indonesia nah uh, nanti kita simpan aja catatannya dulu nanti kita akan ada uh, tanya jawab tapi uh, kita akan masuk ke uh, pembicara kedua hari ini uh, kita akan undang Prof uh, Profesor Ian Dulu untuk ke uh, uh, we'll, uh, we invite uh, Profesor Ian Dulu as a second speaker so uh, today's uh, let, let me introduce uh, Profesor Ian Dulu uh, He is the uh, he's a long list uh, CPH because uh, he's been with this uh, tax profession for the last 20 years. <laughs> More than 30 years. So he's currently the uh, senior uh, principal tax knowledge management. So of the IBFD. IBFD is the most uh, probably prestigious tax uh, research uh, institution based in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, he has been in this, uh, uh, been with IBFD for the last 19 years, so it must be uh, very, very uh, familiar with the whole uh, IBFD system. And, and he has also some some uh, outstanding uh, position and, and very prestigious position. And uh, in addition to that, he's uh, the professor of international and European tax law at uh, I, I hope I uh, correctly pronounce Lodz University in Poland, and visiting professor in uh, Renmin University in Beijing and and of the finance university in Moscow. This one interesting, uh, and also in, in some uh, visiting professor and teaching in some uh, prestige universities like uh, Sao Paulo, Leiden, and uh, Astri and Amsterdam University. And you, you have to clarify this one. He's also a uh, knight in the order of merit of the Republic of Poland. Interesting, so. <laughs> Uh, he will be speaking uh, on uh, more on the uh, recent international tax. Uh, uh, we yesterday discussed about on uh, the unification, the idea of the unification of uh, one pretty models because we have now two models as a reference: the UN and, and the OECD. So and and also uh, multilateral instruments. Beneficial owner and also uh, general type and the avoidance purpose. So now give applause to Professor Yan. Uh, uh, 45 minutes, as you know, that uh, they are very good, so they do not provide you any warning. Okay. <laughs> Stop. Applause is yours now. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. It is a great pleasure to be here again for the second time. Uh, I really enjoy being here. And uh, with a relatively short period of time, we have quite some ambition to discuss several topics with you. 
I think the greatest ambition was for my predecessor to say something about BEPS in 45 minutes, and he did it in a wonderful way. So I will speak about BEPS also. You cannot speak about international tax law today without mentioning BEPS. For the rest, my presentation looks a bit like breakfast in Indonesia when you go to the fresh fruit table. That means you have a wide selection of nice fruits and we will see how much of it we can cover. So, when we talk a little bit about the models, as was mentioned by the chairman, we currently have two tax treaty models. The one is a model developed by the OECD, particularly for treaties between developed countries. The other one was developed by the United Nations, and particularly designed for treaties between developed and developing countries. The major difference between the two models is that in the OECD model there is a greater focus on international allocation of income to the resident state and limited allocation of taxation right to the source state. Between two OECD countries that's not a big problem because the economies are comparable. There is as much import and exports to the countries. So to restrict the taxation of the source state is not a big problem because once you are the source state, then you are the resident state between two countries with comparable economies. When you have the OECD model compared to the UN model, in the UN model with developing country, usually there is a bigger investment flow from developed country into developing country than the other way around. And for that reason, in that model, there is more attention for taxing right to the source state. These two models exist already for a long time, and due to the different position of staffing, the OECD model has been updated many times more than the UN model. The latest revision of these models is from 2017. And when you look at the words, the last few sentences on the slide, you can see that it has become much more extensive, elaborate and complicated. If you look at the number of articles in these model treaties are about the same, 32 and 31 articles, but when you look at the increase of the commentaries explaining these provisions, they have boomed due to the inclusion of the BEPS provision, which were just mentioned. Part of the BEPS provision require changes in domestic legislation, but many others have proposals to change the treaties. And in the 2017 version, all these possible changes of the treaties have been included in the models, and thus we see that in the OECD model, after including these measures, the commentaries have grown from 447 pages to 600 pages, and in the UN model even from 443 to 755 pages, to explain 30 articles. So that makes clear to you that it's a complicated matter. Today we live in the digitalized economy, Miranda is going to speak about that too, but sometimes we understand better when we see the, the hardcore stuff. So this is the OECD model with its commentaries and this is the United Nations model with its commentaries. So you understand that in a limited period of time we can only cover a limited number of things. When we look at the update of the 2017 UN model, United Nations model, there are two sets of changes. There are the changes caused by the BEPS, so introducing the BEPS treaty provisions in this new model and the commentaries to it, but there are also a number of specific changes of the UN model which are specific to the UN model itself which we do not find in the OECD model. 
What I will do is highlight some of the most important non-BEPS changes, BEPS you have just been talking about. I will highlight some of the non-BEPS changes, then say something about the difference of the models. Do we have more differences now? Do we have less differences? And then we continue with some other topic. These, this is an enumeration of the non-BEPS related changes in the United Nations model. And if you look at this, it seems quite a number of changes. It is not as bad as it seems because quite a lot of them are all related, about four to five, to one topic which is a change in the models of the taxation of the profits from international profit of shipping and airline, which has a very special regime which I will not enter into, but there were some substantive changes in the rules of that article. There are several other articles mentioned. I will, we cannot discuss all of them. I will just highlight a few to show you the importance of the changes in some of them. If we overall look at the revision of the two models, it is very interesting to note that already for many years, the number of differences between those models have been around 30. And these are also some bigger, but also some smaller differences. And if you want to read more about the specifics of the UN model, you find a reference to an article where we discussed the use of the UN model in practice in more than 1800 tax treaty. I was heading a research team on that, which analyzed about 60,000 data to be able to write that article. And what is very interesting that after the big updates which we have now, in total the number of differences is still about the same. Because the BEPS related changes were almost all the same, with a few exceptions. And for the other changes, some preserved the special position of the UN model, so it didn't change the number of differences, some reduced the number of differences, and others created new differences. And if you look at those, we cannot discuss all of them in the time allocated. The funny thing is that when you take the reduction of the differences and the increase, you again end up a little bit with the same number. I particularly put all these things on the slides because if you get the slides and you want to do further research, you can more specifically look into the provision. What I find a little bit worrying is the fact that due to the limited staffing of the United Nations Tax Department, they only have five tax people working there permanently at the OECD, more than 100. So more than 20 times more. And as a consequence of that, there are quite a number of updates of the OECD model which have not yet been discussed at the UN. So where the UN has not yet decided to change the commentaries or not. And I find this in particularly worrying when it is about changes in commentaries to the articles which are the same. So, for instance, the main rule on the permanent establishment is the same in the both models. But meanwhile, the explanation of that term was changed and amended a few times in the OECD commentaries, but not yet also looked at in the context of the UN. That is worrying if you have the same wording, but the commentaries are not aligned. In other areas of the permanent establishment, the UN model is different. So then it's logical that also the commentaries are not aligned. Just to take out one of the examples, and then you see typically what happens in law, that you only need to take out a few words and the scope of a provision is much bigger. 
one of the specific provisions of the UN model is if a company resident in one country provides services in another country, but not through a fixed place, not through an office established there, but by the specialist providing the services, for instance, traveling from one place to another in the other country. In that case, there is no permanent establishment and services, the profits, could not be taxed in the source state. However, the UN model has a provision that if the service provider provides such services in a country for more than 183 days in a 12-month period, for the same or connected projects, that then there is a deemed permanent establishment and the source state is allowed to tax. The problem in that provision was each time discussion about whether projects were same or connected. And now in the latest revision of the UN model, they have taken out those words in red for the same or connected project, which means that the scope of that provision allowing source taxing right for the source state has become much bigger because now if a foreign service provider provides services more than 183 days it's allowed to be taxed in the source state even if they are not connected projects. When we talk about the services the situation becomes more complicated under the treaties because we also got a provision on services in Article 14 of the models, which is about independent personal service provider. We also see more and more treaty with separate provision on taxation of services. And in this model, one of the most important new provision is a specific provision on the provision of technical services. I will briefly talk about that too. The special thing of the last one is that it does not require that the person is and or the company is physically performing the services in the other country. That is new in the Article 12a and because we also talk about the digital economy, in the digital economy there is also no or limited presence in the other state. This approach of Article 12a may overlap in the future with provision of services in the digitalized economy and the possible ways that will be taxed. Then there is an interesting provision on the taxation on capital gain of shares, of which the value is for more than 50% determined by immovable property in the source country. Normally, in the OECD model, if a company resident in one country sells the shares in a company in the other country, the OECD model allocates the taxing right exclusively to the resident state. However, if the value of those shares is determined by immovable property located in the source state, then there is a taxing right for the capital gain to the source state. This was already in the United Nations model, but what is an important thing is there was an exception when you were calculating whether it was the value of immovable property for immovable property which was actively used in the business. So, for instance, if you had a hotel which was in a company and the hotel was not making big profits, maybe not a very good hotel, but the hotel was located in a very important street in the city, the value of the immovable property part would be bigger than the value of the shares relating to the profitability. So, under the exception, if the shares in such a company were sold, they were not covered by this immovable property uh, article. And thus, there was only taxing right in principle in the resident state. By taking out that exception 
for immovable property used in the active business, like a hotel, like a ship wharf, but also the licenses in the extractive industries. It means that also here the scope of taxation for the source state has been enlarged. Another example of sale of shares is if they are not deriving their value from the movable property. As I told you, under the OECD model, then the taxing rights, when these shares are sold, are only to the country of residence. In the United Nations model, there is a taxing right for the country of source, if a certain level of participation is exceeded. So that percentage is left open because that depends on the bilateral negotiation. Also this provision has a much larger scope now in the new model because it's no longer limited to shares in companies but also comparable interest in other entities. So the scope of this provision leading to more taxing right in the source state has also been substantially increased. This is this provision about fees for technical services. So again, remember that if a service provider is resident of one country and provides the services in the other country without being present there, under the current models, there is no taxing right on the profits of the services in the source state. But under this provision, which is new in the 2017 model, like in the case of interest and royalties, there will now be a source taxing right for fees for technical services, even though the services are not provided physically in the country of source. So what we see there is a pattern of wording which is very similar as the article on interest and the article on royalties, stating that if the payment for such fees arise in the source state and are paid to a resident of the other state, the source state is allowed to tax, but if the recipient in the other state is the beneficial owner, there is a limitation to the percentage of tax which may be levied on such fees. What is very crucial then is of course what does it mean? And fees for technical services are payments made in consideration for any service of a managerial, technical or consultancy nature. So a very broad definition. <coughs> However, and that's why we have these commentaries, the commentaries explain that the only services following under this provision are tailored services. They must be specifically tailored to the needs of the customer. So if, for instance, the IBFD provides access to its databases, this is not a technical service because the databases are generic information about country and not specifically tailored to the needs of a particular client. However, if we do a client research assignment, a specific client research assignment for an Indonesian company, and we never come to Indonesia, everything is done by teleconferencing we do the research and we give access via a link to a database with the results of our study, then the payment of that fee would fall under this provision because then it is a tailored, specific technical service provided by, in this case, the IBFD to Indonesia. There are some technical provision further, which I will skip for time's sake, and will say something about treaty shopping. Treaty shopping is the only kind of shopping I am interested in. I am not interested in regular shopping. If my wife invites me to join her for shopping, I know 
after 35 years of marriage, don't join her, don't join her. Please let her first go to 10 shops, and by the time she has made up her mind, I'm willing to come, you know, and to approve the final result, if desirable. But treaty shopping is something more interesting for tax people. So treaty shopping basically deals with the situation that a taxpayer derives income from a country and would have to pay a high withholding tax on the income derived from that country because its country has no treaty with the country from where the income is derived or an unfavorable treaty. So to remedy that situation, one puts an additional company, an intermediary company, in a third state, and that third state does have a favorable treaty with the source state. So one channels the income not directly from the source country to the person actually behind it or the company, but it is channeled through an intermediary company in a country that has a favorable treaty, so that if the payment of the income is made to the company in the third country, there is a favorable treaty tax reduction, and of course the planning happens in such a way that there is no additional tax in the intermediary company, so that tax can be saved. That treaty shopping is one of the things which is targeted by BEPS, base erosion and profit shifting. And basically BEPS gives a couple of prescriptions how to best fight the treaty shopping. One of them is to introduce specific wording in the preamble to the treaties. The other one is to use the concept of beneficial ownership, which was mentioned previously. The new ones in the BEPS are to have either a limitation on benefits provision or a principal purpose test. I will come back briefly to the principal purpose test. Just mention one short thing about limitation on benefits. That's an American invention. And it means that if you want to claim the benefits of a treaty, it's not enough that you are a resident of a contracting state, but you must meet a number of tests under the LOB, the limited, uh, limitation of benefits. These are very detailed provision. So I will not discuss these now. The beneficial ownership is a notion which was only introduced at some time in the models. It was not there from the beginning. It was only introduced in 1977 and later in the OECD model. And this is also to fight the treaty shopping. And it says that if the recipient of the income is not the beneficial owner, you cannot claim the treaty benefits. And this word is not defined in the tax treaty. It is a requirement in Articles 10, 11 and 12. I guess this is just thunderstorm, not salutes of honor, which is possible as well, you never know. Um, but the beneficial ownership, therefore, was a lot of debate in the commentary what it exactly means. And the commentary clarified it is not a pure intermediary receiving the money for someone else, like a bank. If I have shares and the bank collects the dividends for me, obviously it's not the bank that is the beneficial owner. But because of this treaty shopping, channeling income through other entity, it was further clarified that even a person who is formally the owner of the income cannot claim the benefits if, due to a set of contracts, the powers of disposal over that money received are so small that in fact the person is comparable to such an intermediary. For instance, if you have provided a loan to the source state, you receive the interest, but you had to borrow the money yourself and had to pay an interest on that loan. 
then the money in fact flows through the intermediary entity. Interest received on the loan provided, but also interest paid on the loan you had to take up yourself if you are in the intermediary <coughs> country. And a lot of questions remained on this notion and there was different case law in different countries. And for that reason, in the OECD model, there is a clarification since 2014, which clearly says beneficial ownership only has a limited treaty meaning and not a broad meaning under domestic law. And that is a problem in a number of countries where a national definition is used of beneficial owner, which is much broader than just looking at whether the person who received the payment has the disposal over the money. And this kind of disposal over the money is formulated there. You are only entitled and the beneficial owner if you have the full right to use and enjoy the payment without being under the obligation to pass on the income to someone else. That means that certain forms of treaty shopping, like just channeling through the income to a person in a third country, cannot have the treaty benefits but that there are other forms of treaty shopping which are not covered by this provision and there the commentaries make clear you cannot capture those under beneficial ownership but then you have the specific rules of the limitation of benefits or of the, per, uh, the principal purpose test which is a general anti-abuse provision. This is the wording of this general anti-abuse provision which has been introduced into tax treaty. The basic idea behind it is not new. It was already called the guiding principle in the commentaries, inserted in the commentaries in 2003. But that was dealing with the case where you had a domestic anti-abuse provision and then the question was, can you apply a domestic anti-abuse provision also under the treaties? In fact, no, that positive answer, if certain conditions are met, is now codified by putting that principle now in the text of the treaties in the new Article 29, Paragraph 9. There is, however, one big difference with the guiding principle which we had, and that is that the burden of proof, so who has to prove what in order to apply this very important anti-abuse provision, has been shifted to the favor of the tax authority. Because if you look at the wording, for the tax authority it is enough if it is reasonable to conclude there is abuse. And there is a counter evidence possible for the taxpayer, but then the taxpayer has to establish that granting the benefit is not troublesome in the context of the object and purpose of the treaty. So the tax authorities is enough if it's reasonable. For the counter proof, it must be established. That is hard proof. I want to say a few words about the multilateral instrument and I am looking sometimes a little bit strange with these eyes. It's not because I have an effect in my eyes, but it's because someone is indicating the time regularly there and I have to observe that uh, of course as well. Now what is this multilateral instrument? Perhaps section 15 says we have so many wishes to change the treaty to add anti-abuse provision. If we have to change the thousands of existing of treaty, that will take decades. Because if you want to add that anti-abuse provision and you have to renegotiate, the other party will say, oh, but I got some other points I want to discuss with you. So to avoid that, a special multilateral convention has been established, negotiated by 94 countries, which put in one move, 
add those anti-abuse provisions to the existing treaties, so not having the need to renegotiate all these treaties. Now, this would amend all existing treaty. That means treaty in different languages, with different structures, <coughs> old treaty, new treaty. So it is a very generically worded instrument. It is not a specific amending protocol where you can say paragraph, article, this is replaced by that. You cannot, because the same rule may be in different articles in the different existing treaties. So this model is formulated more per topic and in a generic way. This multilateral treaty, which has also been signed but not yet ratified by Indonesia, has meanwhile been signed by many countries. It entered into force in July of this year and for the first 47 treaties will be affected by this from the 1st of January of the forthcoming year. When all the countries have ratified then more than 1,400 treaty will be affected by this provision. But this treaty works in a very complicated way, because if, for instance, the Netherlands signed up, it has 90 treaties, <coughs> it has to list which treaties it wants to be covered. If they are not listing, they will not be covered by this agreement. And there can be various reasons why not to list a treaty. Then there is more things that the people who sign up for the treaty and who are not including certain treaty, when they are part of the BEPS inclusive framework, they must still make some amendments to the treaty. So then they will have to do renegotiation for those. <coughs> What is special is the second element, is that there are only a few provisions which are mandatory. Most of them are optional and if a partner signing makes a reservation to those, that provision will not apply under this treaty. Reservation can be withdrawn, but they cannot be added. Then the impact of this convention is further complicated because there are also special rules how you need to read this provision in relation to the existing one, the so-called compatibility clauses. And then the countries have to specifically indicate which provision of their existing treaty is affected. And if the two countries have not indicated the same provision, again, there will be no change. So the end effect depends very much on what the country has done as a position. When we look at the Netherlands, the Netherlands made only very limited general reservation. So that general reservation means that that provision will not be changed in its treaties. And it made some part reservation to safeguard existing provisions which are already in the treaty. <coughs> Other ones will be uh, impacted. And for instance, in all the treaties, this principle purpose test will be added. <coughs> I will not go into all the other details. When we look at Indonesia-Dutch treaty, how it interacts, it has a number of specific features. So, as Indonesia made also a number of general reservations, these provisions on which either the Netherlands or Indonesia made a reservation will not be affecting the existing treaties because there is such a reservation. And here you see a short overview of the effects in the Indonesia-Netherlands Treaty. And just by looking at it, you already have a hunch that this is a rather complicated process. And that's why a number of countries have decided to publish what we call synthesized text, 
which actually are not an amending protocol, but which have the text of the treaty and then kind of side comments that you need to take into account when you want to apply the treaty. However, it's not obliged to make the synthesized text. So if countries decide not to do so, it will be difficult for taxpayer <coughs> to exactly know the impact of the MLA. My last five to ten minutes, because I am observing the time, there is timely alerts, I want to speak a little bit about these two models. So this is two model. You understand this already looks a bit troublesome to have two. It's even much worse because this is only the 2017 version. If you look at the previous version, it becomes a huge pile. And for that reason, I have written an article in which I give a number of arguments why I think we should get away from these two models and in the end have only one model. Actually, it's nice for an old guy to say so, but this is old-fashioned. This is old-fashioned stuff. We should get away with it in modern times. It's not suitable. It's a duplication of work. There's multiple sources of information which is not very useful. And in practice, in treaties, there is a mixture of the provision which makes it even more difficult to interpret because each time you have to go to different sources. Finally, there are big changes which need to be done together and not separately in the OECD and in the UN. So what I propose as a model is not another book because it's not manageable in a book. It's a modern database. A database which has one common structure of the provision which are identical and then a few options for the positions which are different where the commentaries would also provide the pros and cons of those options. Of course there is an impact on the way the work has now been organized. So I make in the article, which you see mentioned below, a number of proposals how we can solve these problems, which are sensitive, because the OECD thinks they are the most important organization in the world, and the UN thinks the same. So they, it's difficult for them to compromise. Yet I think it is worthwhile to really research this opportunity, because I think the benefits would be that we have one source of technically reliable information because it has different options. You can still maintain a difference in tax policy between developed and developing country. Um, it fits the modern world much better because this is the old world. The old world is rich people and poor country. This is not true. There are a lot of countries now in between rich and poor. So this whole concept of the model, in my view, is an outdated concept. It would also give more equality and opportunity to the negotiator of developing country because they see the option with the pros and cons which they can use as bargaining chips during the negotiation. And finally, if we have everything in a database organized like that, it will be much easier for taxpayers, practitioner, administration, but also judges to find the right information and the right comments on the specific provision. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't see them wave anymore. I think I am exactly on the time. I'm sorry it's been maybe a bit overwhelming and a bit fast, but that's when you are an ambitious person and you want to deliver and provide a lot of information in a very short time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Jan de Hoede. Very enthusiastic and dynamic presentation. I think it's because of you had a morning glory during lunch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mungkin saya cerita dari tadi pagi eh semalam kita makan 
di restoran Indonesia uh, makan uh, uh, kangkung jadi aku bahasa Inggrisnya mau di jadi mungkin uh, katanya kita bilang kalau mau uh, makan kangkung biasanya ngantuk tapi ini kan enggak uh, oke okay, we we learn a lot from uh, Profesor Yan uh, the difference between OECD and your model so basically they represent uh, two different uh, uh, side uh, OECD was drafted or intended for uh, the more developed countries, while UN is for uh, developing countries. Then uh, the uh, following discussion was uh, about uh, development of uh, the model itself, OECD and UN models. Uh, in, if, if there's no question from the floor, so I'll have some list of questions for you. Uh, the next one is uh, the idea to have only one model, so it will save our time to read and, and probably uh, it will, I mean, ease the student's burden as well in the, in the future. Because I had to read, when I was still a student, I had to read uh, 15,000, sorry, 1,500 pages of the models, the commentary. So, Probably later on, then that's only OECD, OECD plus UN. Uh, and uh, we have the next uh, presenter, and I'm uh, inviting uh, Miranda, Professor Miranda Stewart. Me. Let me read the uh, uh, Professor Miranda's. Uh, CV. Uh, professor Miranda Stewart is, is currently the uh, professor of law at the University of Melbourne. So, and uh, she uh, told us earlier that she has a lot of Indonesian students as well taking a uh, master degree in the University of Melbourne and also the some of alumni. She is also the director of the tax group uh, within the University and the uh, fellow at the Tax and uh, Transfer uh, Policy Institute at the Crawford uh, School of the Public Policy, the Australian National University. Uh, she's also the uh, chairperson of uh, International Fiscal Association uh, for uh, Asia Pacific Region. So uh, she will be speaking, uh, suppose more on digital economy, but I advise her that we had more or less the same session uh, last week on digital economy. So uh, she will be speaking uh, in addition to digital economy, probably more on uh, tax policy because uh, this also would be uh, provide uh, uh, more information for students and for the uh, all participants. Miranda, the floor is yours. This is the English editorial. 
And I think this is about the tax bill that uh, mentioned, uh, Professor mentioned before, uh, where you have an election next year. And you have uh, some serious policy issues to consider in Indonesia about uh, having uh, adequate tax revenue uh, to uh, have a stable uh, social inclusion in the country. Right. This is a core issue for all countries. So, a lot of tax issues are actually uh, domestic policy debates, <coughs> national policy debate. Yep. At the same time, we have something else going on, which is what you've had the previous two presentations about. Wow, this is the thunder of BEPS. <laughs> So I need to jump to another slide before we go back. I just need to check the number. Okay. This is my favorite uh, image ever. Uh, a student found this for me. Uh, he did a presentation in my class and he used this. You might be familiar with this sun. 404 era. If you use a PC, right? It's a PC era. Google. Sorry, the tax you are looking for cannot be found. <laughs> so we are trying to collect adequate tax revenue for our domestic policy, right? So that Indonesia or Australia or the Netherlands can have uh, adequate. Uh, public spending and welfare for their own people. At the same time, we have this global digital layer uh, happening uh, in parallel and intersecting with everything that is happening in the domestic uh, politics. So I want to say a little bit about uh, broader tax policy and some of these uh, interactions between the two. Uh, the really detailed law treaties and, the, and so on, I, I won't be talking about so much uh, today. So, let me go back to my beginning. Uh, I just want to give you a small ad, first of all. So, I'm at Melbourne University, but I'm also connected with uh, this uh, Research Policy Institute in Australia, Tax and Transfer Policy Institute. And if you are interested in new research from around the world uh, about tax policy issues or public finance issues, we have a blog, Oz Tax Policy Blog. We have short pieces in English about by researchers about their new research papers. Uh, so all sorts of different topics. Uh, so um, I hope that uh, if you're interested, you can go to oztaxpolicy.com. Uh, and you can uh, do some looking around to see if you're interested. Okay. So I'm not going to go through all of these. I just want to start with some background. So I know that uh, the editorial about tax reform for Indonesia, one of the key issues is raising some more revenue. Uh, this is a challenge for Indonesia. It's difficult for all countries, but of course different countries have different tax level, right? Different tax to GDP ratios. This is the OECD statistics. Uh, does there a oh, oh, it did. Whoops. There we go. Is there a pointed? Yes. Yeah. So um, Australia is here. Uh, around about 28% of GDP, tax to GDP. 28 to 30 depends what you count. Uh, the Netherlands, where are we? Yeah, the Netherlands is up here somewhere. <coughs> is it here? I can't see it very well. In here? Uh, around about 38% of GDP. Yeah. The most, the largest tax levels in the world, they're famously the Scandinavian countries. 
uh, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, right? Uh, so also France has a very high tax to GDP ratio. You know, in France, they are having riots at the moment. You read the news? What are they rioting about? Tax. Tax. They're having a tax riot in France. Fuel taxes. The government said they would put the taxes up. They created a violent uh, protest. Yeah? So tax levels in France are very high. These are the highest tax levels, 45 to 50% of GDP, half of the economy. I colored these countries in green. These are the Scandinavian states. Something else to realize though, they are the most equal countries in the world. Right? The income levels between people in the Scandinavian countries are the most equal in the world. So there is a relationship. I think, between the tax level uh, and quality. So, what about in the, our region, Australia, Indonesia? This is recent statistics from the OECD, the new stats on Asia and Pacific. Um, here is Australia, 27.8% of GDP. Here is Indonesia. Here are other countries that are our neighbors, right, in the region. Uh, Korea, quite high. Japan is more tax than Australia and New Zealand. But notice that all Asia-Pacific countries are lower than the OECD average. For some reason, in our part of the world, we collect less taxes than in Europe, basically. Uh, but we have here Thailand, Philippines, Singapore, PNG are all succeeding in collecting more. So there is domestic political work to be done. It's not just a global issue. I want to show you another chart. So this is Australia's history in taxes. Do you know when Australia was formed as a country? As a nation? Does anybody know? 1901 is our federal constitution for the nation state. Before this, we were colonies of Britain, right? Separate colonies. 1901, tax to GDP ratio of Australia, 5% of GDP. This is through the 20th century. Every year, this is taxes go up. This is World War II. Taxes go up a lot in wartime, right, to pay for the war. But they stay high after World War II. The taxes stay high. Why? What are Australians willing to pay tax for after the war? Public health, hospitals, age pensions, schools, right? This is what the taxes are paying for in the second half of the 20th century. Taxes go up even more. This is free, uh, free medicine, right? It's also, revenues go up here because we are a resource producing country like Indonesia, right? Resource exporting, coal, iron ore, minerals, gas, oil and gas, yeah, like Indonesia. This is the commodity boom, commodity price boom, right? Iron ore and coal prices are very high, revenues go up. Do you know what this is? Revenues come down suddenly. This last one is 2013, it's a little out of date. What happens? How does the revenue go down like that? Why? It's the global financial crisis. Yeah. Revenues go down. You see how bumpy it is? Revenues go up and down with recessions, but also because of policy. So, I know I'm taking most of my time talking about this. <laughs> uh, the point is that the shape of the tax system is the same as the shape of the story of a nation. Right? It's up to the state to decide the people how you're going to revenue and deliver public services. Okay, so what is tax for? Public goods and services, of course, social inclusion, redistribution. Also to support economic growth, also to stabilize the economy. 
in times of good and bad uh, recession. Okay. So I'm going to jump over a few uh, tax policy points now and move on to think about the global digital economy. So, what is it that you're trying to tax inside Indonesia and then in the global economy? So you're trying to tax land and resources, yeah, labor, work, uh, and capital, right? Wealth, investment, income. So we say that these tax bases are more or less mobile in the economy. Do you know what I mean if I say tax base is mobile, it can move. So which is the least mobile tax base? This one, huh? Land and resources. We say we should be able to tax our land and our oil and gas, right? Uh, actually, we're not that good at it. It's not as easy as it looks to tax correctly. Labor is more mobile, but still most of us live in the same place most of the time. And ideally, we should be able to tax our wages. Capital is the most mobile. Yeah? So we talk about global capitalism and investment flowing from one country to another. And this is an effect of opening the borders for investment. Right? This is economic globalization. So we say this is the most elastic base. So a consequence of this is that we have tax competition between countries, right? The tax cost becomes a part of the competition for investment. Uh, Australia is competing, the US is competing, European countries are competing for investment uh, and lowering their corporate tax rates. You heard it from your professor earlier, right? The corporate tax rates are coming down. Okay, I'm going to jump again. So we have two layers here that we have the global economy, moving investment, moving workers. Wow. This is the, the god of the global economy. Uh, global, of course, we are moving goods and services around, supplying goods and services across border. We are moving investment, individual investment, foreign direct, corporate investment, and people. Digital, of course, we are using platforms, we are using Uber, Grab, we are having um, Amazon to shop with shopping online, um, we are using hotel booking services, we are paying with digital currency, all these new developments. Yeah. So many issues are both global and digital, right? They combine. So um, you guys can take this away. These are just different elements of the digital economy. And of course, we know it's growing, getting bigger, right? This is internet traffic, it's global internet traffic predicted till 2020, just increasing. So some countries are highly digitized, Australia is highly digitized, uh, lots of people are using digital forms, uh, lots of businesses are using digital uh, connections and finance payment systems and intangible property. Indonesia is quite digitized, right? You guys all have your phones? Yeah? You use, um, what do you call it, Gojek? It's very impressive. Does Gojek pay tax? Interesting question. <laughs> this is a really interesting statistic. Uh, this is mobile phone access in Indonesia and the United States. Indonesia has taken over. You have more mobile phone use in Indonesia than they do in the United States. And you are just still tiny. Right? You're growing, right? Digital is growing. So digital is important for tax and other policy areas, right? It's very important for
for a country like Indonesia, with a big population, right, big market, uh, and you know the use of the digital economy. In globalization, there are some indexes that I won't go through, but this is kind of interesting to compare. Uh, so some researchers try to look at how globalized countries are. So this is comparing Australia and Indonesia. This is looking at your laws and your policy, how globalized are you? Australia is green and Indonesia is blue. So since the 1970s, both countries are more global than we used to be, right? We used to be more closed. Now we're more open to trade and investment. This is in practice. Uh, and in fact, in practice, Indonesia is less global than in, in your laws and policy. In reality, you have less global traffic, even though your law and policy is reasonably So that's kind of interesting, right? You, you're not using the full potential for globalization in Indonesia yet. Okay, so some countries are digital and global. We have a lot of digital and global. Um, Indonesia is still described as quite restrictive on digital trade across borders. Um, China is the most restrictive. China is very digitized, lots of digital stuff, but closed borders, right? Capital controls, they restrict, no Facebook, yeah. No uh, Google, right? They keep it internal, Alibaba. Okay. So, which kinds of taxes are the most vulnerable for globalization and digitization? Which ones are most difficult to collect in a global digital world? You should be able to be collecting income tax, even with globalization, but this is where Indonesia has a challenge, right? You need to be better at collecting tax on your domestic wages in this country right? because it's less risky for globalization. Corporate tax is very vulnerable to globalization. The revenues might be at risk. Wealth and asset taxes are difficult. Land tax is less risky. Sales taxes are a bit at risk for digital commerce, right? If you can't change digital commerce. Okay, so the effect of the global digital economy on taxes depends on the kind of tax we're talking about. Okay, so what we're trying to do, of course, we're trying to deliver sufficient revenue to pay for the welfare system and public goods in an efficient way, and a fair way, and simple way. And we want our system to be resilient so it doesn't uh, get destroyed if the economy changes. And here we are back now. This is tax reform that you have to think about in Japan, in, uh, in Indonesia. Okay, so I want to spend the second part of my talk talking a little bit about uh, the global digital economy, uh, sales taxes, and corporate tax. Right. So we'll come back to the Fed a little bit, back to the Fed's issues. Um, so the Fed's project you had, um, Professor summarized the actions in the Fed. Right. Fifteen actions from the OECD. Action one was about uh, digital economy. And the only thing it talked about was GSD collection. Action 7 talked about uh, permanent establishment. And we had Professor Yan also talking about the, the definition of the place of business and expanding the permanent establishment idea to cover digital businesses or more activities in a country. Transfer pricing and CFC rules and the anti-abuse rule. But the reality is that the OECD says that these actions are not enough. They cannot really solve the problem of the global digital economy. So we need to keep thinking more about what we might do. And this is why you see countries doing so many different things, right? So many different policies, like policy experiments. 
It's like the world is like a lab, right? Every country is like, what can we do that might work, right? It will work for our country. We think it's a good idea. We have political support so we can pass the law. So in India, you have the equalization levy. In Australia and the UK, we have the diverting profits tax. Uh, in the Netherlands, they are changing their ruling system uh, to be more, uh, collecting more revenue actually. Every country is actually doing something a little bit different. <laughs> Some countries are just waiting, wait and see, right? Wait and see what the rest of the world will do. Okay. So, what are some of the things we need to think about? So I want to say something about sales tax and tell you a little bit about what uh, Australia is doing and you might want to think about what Indonesia should be doing with the VAT and then something about uh, uh, the corporate tax. You all know how the VAT works, value added tax. You have the VAT here? Yeah? So who pays the tax? I have some pride. You can tell me who pays the tax. You get a koala bear. <laughs> who pays the tax in the VAT? Business? You need to stick your hand up if you can tell me. Someone can? Come on. <laughs> koala bear? Yes? Can someone tell me? No? Yes? The consumer. Okay. I said who pays the tax. Who pays. So you told me who bears the tax. Right? The economic, you are right. The economic incidence of the tax. We just said Okay, so the consumer is supposed to bear the tax. Who pays the tax? To the government. Who writes the check? Corporation? Business? You go to a restaurant, pay for a meal, who pays the tax? Restaurant? Who bears the tax? Customer. Yeah? Okay. So you know how it works, basically. Okay. So what happens in a world of uh, e-commerce? Right. Digital commerce is going to be the biggest retail platform in the world. Okay. On track to be the biggest. And Asia Pacific is very advanced in digital commerce. Right. Already, 13 percent of Purchases in Asia Pacific are on digital platforms. Korea, China, of course, are leading the way. But you guys are doing it too. So, who pays the tax if you have digital purchases? Do you have, does Gojek pay tax? Yeah? If you order food, go eat. Yeah? Yeah, like Uber Eats, we have Uber Eats in Australia. Who pays the tax on this? Anybody? Is there any tax? No, nobody knows? Maybe there is no tax? Maybe one of my professors can tell me if I'm right or wrong. Yeah. So, maybe the platform should pay. Okay, what about cross-border? Let's say you are buying something from overseas and you use uh, Amazon, okay, or Alibaba, something to buy. So historically, we know that we should have the consumer should bear the tax. You're right. If I'm here in Indonesia and I buy a book on Amazon, the book is delivered to me, I should bear tax, right? Indonesian VAT. Is there any tax if I do that in Indonesia? There is tax on Amazon? It's true. 
Maybe. Does anyone know? Do you pay tax on buying books on, online? You have no idea, do you? <laughs> so in Australia, no, it's tax free. So ideally we have the consumer pay, but Amazon is offshore, right? They are offshore. They have no presence in Australia, right? no business in Australia. They are not subject. So traditionally we would say, uh, pragmatically we could not collect the tax from Amazon. So we would say business to consumer transaction, actually it would be the seller country that might collect tax, or not at all. But now we are trying to change this. So one of the new BEPS developments, post BEPS, Global Digital Economy, we are trying to make sure that the online seller actually has to collect the tax and pay to the government, right? If you buy the book here in your country. Or if you import digital services. So who uses Netflix? Yeah? Do you pay tax? No. Right? Digital download. Who downloads music? Do you have Spotify? Yeah? 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 No tax, right? Mm -hmm. Spotify, but advertises okay, instead. Okay, so how do we do it in the new world of online sale? How do we collect? So the OECD has now said since 2015, we should try to collect tax on the online sales, B2C transactions in the country where the customer lives, right? Indonesia is here, Indonesia should tax, the customer is here. But how do we do it? We have to make the supplier register for VAT or GST and the supplier has to pay. It's very difficult to do. So in the European Union, they have started to do this. They have established a rule for supply of digital services, telecommunications, TV, radio, Netflix, right? Uh, they have established a rule they call a one-stop shop. Uh, EU Moss is a couple of years old now. If, I'm, if Amazon is selling into Europe, right? Amazon, the tax will be collected by one country, the VAT, and then will be shared with the other countries. Yeah. It's like a cooperation between countries to collect the tax. So instead of competing, the countries are cooperating to collect that tax. Now, they are seeking even to extend this to small value goods like books. Right, we buy a book online, we should be able to tax it. So they have approved extending the one-stop shop for small, small purchases into Europe. But it's still not enacted and it's not easy to achieve. So in Australia, we have, we call it the Netflix tax. We enacted it only uh, two years ago to apply GST to downloads of music and so on. But it requires uh, Netflix to register. They have, they voluntarily have to register because how can we enforce it? It's difficult to enforce. So we are looking to cooperate with business yeah, in order to collect the tax from consumers. Since July of this year, we have a new rule to collect the tax on buying goods online. And if I buy books on Amazon and they come from overseas, then Amazon will have to collect the tax, the GST, and pay to the government. It's called an electronic distribution platform, right? The platform operator has to collect. So, for example, have you heard of Etsy? <coughs> Etsy or Alibaba, or, you know, where you have third-party mentions, you can sell something online to somebody else, yeah? You can make something yourself and sell online. So, you would, uh, the platform would pay the tax. 
instead of you directly as the supplier, the platform would collect and pay. So this is an example. So Australia is the first country in the world to put this platform tax, right? The online retailers, they don't like it, right? The digital businesses, they don't like it. So we are now in a little bit of a battle. Amazon has left the country. Or rather, Amazon say that their US website is not available anymore for Australian customers. You can't buy online from US Amazon. You can only buy from Australian Amazon. So they say that uh, Amazon will no longer let third party sellers use the platform because they don't want to collect the GST. So we are in a kind of battle. We want to cooperate, make the big sellers comply, but also we are in a fight with them because they don't want to do the compliance. Uh, okay, so that's all I'm going to say about um, sales. I guess the question is how do we enforce, right? This is the problem. We want to enforce a tax on the digital economy. They have to voluntarily comply. Maybe we could get the big businesses to cooperate and collect tax from the small businesses. Maybe we could get the KPMG, we could ask Equan's firm, he can manage the compliance for businesses, or Deloitte, or PwC, KPMG. Maybe we could have an Asia Pacific one-stop shop, right? Maybe Indonesian revenue can collect and cooperate with countries around the region. Or Singapore could collect from countries around the region. So this is what we have to consider. The governments have to consider these ideas. Okay, a couple of things about company tax. You know already, company tax rates are coming down. Global trend. You already heard. The US is now 21%. But not in Australia. The people, the parliament refused to pass the tax cut. So Australia is now a high tax country in the world. 30% uh, corporate tax rate. What is the Netherlands corporate tax rate? Oh, Netherlands is down to 21%. They have to match the US, right? Because there is a lot of investment through the US into the Netherlands. So we are seeing tax competition countries against each other. The question is, how can we make a company tax work? Right? Company tax is useful for governments, right? It's useful. The company tax can collect the revenue from the source jurisdiction, like Indonesia or Australia. We want to use it to collect that revenue, but we suffer base erosion and profit shifting. Uh, of that tax base. And what do we do with global value chains? Uh, where do you think, have you heard of Nutella? Yes? Do you like Nutella? <laughs> where is Nutella made? Do you know? All over the world. Right? All over the world. Different bits of Nutella comes from the world. Factories, businesses, marketing, the supply chain is global. Yeah? Where is the value created? Which country gets to tax the profit from Nutella? I don't know. <laughs> okay, and in the digital economy, what do we do? We don't have the physical presence of Google or Amazon or Facebook and so on. Um, so we have all these weaknesses in the system. So some key things to think about, we need to work out what are the rules to determine the nexus, the connection between the business and the country to create the jurisdiction to tax. This is what our tax treaties do, right, as well as the domestic law. Then the next question, we have to work out how much profit is allocated to this country. How much profit does Indonesia get to tax? Singapore get to tax, Australia get to tax. The countries have to really negotiate this. Uh, and this is the next step, I think, 
in the BEPS project. So I'm going to jump ahead now and think about some issues. We can go back to our Google slide. So now we are back to Google going around the world, not paying tax. So I guess you are familiar with this because this strategy involves the Netherlands. And actually, there are some examples involving Indonesian companies. Have you heard of this double Irish Dutch sandwich? Did you study it in class? So, the BEPS project, this is a picture from a news article. This was Bloomberg News uh, in 2010. Bloomberg News put this big story out. Google is only paying 2% tax around the world. And they did a picture of the strategy, tax strategy. So do you know how it works? Of course it doesn't, probably doesn't work anymore these days, right? Every tax scheme is fixed up and then there are other opportunities for very good tax advisors like Mr. Econ. <laughs> so, just to show you though, how many countries it needs to make it work. So you have Google in the US, right? Google headquarters. They have websites that we access in Australia, right? Or in Indonesia. The advertiser pays for an ad in Australia. So I'm going to finish with this example, a couple more things. They pay, where does the money go? It doesn't go to the US. The money goes to a subsidiary company in Ireland. They pay for the rights to advertise on Google. It doesn't stop there. Then we have Professor Jan's country. <laughs> the money goes to another subsidiary company in Google in the Netherlands. This is the Dutch in the sandwich, right? Uh, we pay a royalty probably, right? It's probably a royalty for intellectual property. What happens then? It goes back to Ireland. Another company in Ireland uh, is receiving the tax. And there is no withholding tax inside the EU. So now you think surely someone is going to tax it. But under the old rules, this is a company in Bermuda controls this company in Ireland. So for Ireland, this company is not a tax resident, right? This company is uh, a nothing, has no residence in the world. You think, okay, why doesn't the US tax this? The US uses check the box and loopholes in its old CFC rules, so it doesn't see this tax, it doesn't see this entity here. So there is no tax in the U.S. because it's not paid back to the U.S. It stays outside uh, the U.S. There is no tax in Australia because there is no permanent establishment in Australia. No business in Australia. Actually, Australia now enacted an anti-avoidance rule, multinational anti-avoidance law, to deem a permanent establishment. So we overcame the structure this way. Meanwhile, the U.S. enacted their corporate tax reform last year. Now, they will say these profits do have to be taxed at a lower rate. These two changes that have happened, this one is the old rule, we had this mountain. These changes are not the OECD. These are unilateral changes by their own countries. So how do we solve BEPS? Well, maybe we use OECD agreement, but maybe we use unilateral measures. And the problem is that that leads to lots of uh, confusion. Lots of work for Econ, actually. So in Australia, we have this multinational anti-avoidance law, and we have a diverted profits tax. Uh, the US has enacted essentially a kind of integrity rule to tax intangible profit. And some countries, so I'm going to finish up, 
Some countries are enacting digital services taxes to try to address this problem. So you have the Indian approach. So in India, you have this equalization levy. So my time is up, so I'm just going to say a little on this and then stop. So equalization levy, have you heard of this? The Indian uh, digital tax? 6% on the amount paid for advertising revenue. This is how India is taxing Google. Right? This is what they are doing. I don't know, should Indonesia copy India and tax the advertising revenue? Should you have an anti-avoidance rule? Should you change your tax treaties like the OECD Paris project to expand the definition of permanent establishment? Reform transfer policy? I don't know the answer. Right? It's too hard. So I'm going to leave you with that point that actually, who knows what you should do next? It's your problem. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mirata, for.